Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the September Safe Schools meeting. Call to order, uh, six o'clock. We'll start right now with the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. all right, that's a new flag we have today. Thank you. <laughs> Mixing it up. Okay, I, I won't read these guidelines um, unless we have anyone uh, who raises their hand for public comment. Do we have anyone for public comment this evening? At this time, I do not see anyone's hand just yet. Take your time, Mary. I'm just waiting to make sure we're catching up. I do not at this time. No one has put their hand up. Okay, we'll, we'll see uh, at the end of the meeting. We can break our record here. May, approval of minutes for the August Safe Schools Committee meeting. So moved, moved to accept. Do we have a second? Second. All right, thank you. The minutes are approved. And now we'll move on to, we have no item items recommended for work sex work session or action. Uh, there are no informational items, which brings us straight to other business. And, uh, Dr. Bauer, is this you or Mr. Durr? I wanna let Dr. Bauer take the, uh, the reins on this one this evening. The car is yours, Dr. Bauer. Yes, so uh, for those who were unable to join us on Thursday evening, and Chris, if you wouldn't mind pulling up the presentation. Um, so the facts have changed, so has our opinion to some degree. So we spoke on Thursday evening about spectators at athletic events. And uh, in working with our solicitor um, and reading what we, the advice from PDE, uh, SOL District 1 and PSBA, um, it was very up in the air about what would be necessary in order for us to have spectators at athletic events. Um, so at the time on Thursday evening at the beginning of the meeting, when this came before the board, we did not know that we would be meeting on Tuesday evening. Um, so we did draft an appendix E to the return to play plan uh, to address spectators and whether or not the board would give us the authority uh, to have, make a decision on spectators. Uh, so it got a motion. It also got a second. And then we had, I'd, I'd say, 20 to 30 minute conversation regarding it. And ultimately, um, it started to be obvious that we were going to meet this week. So they asked that the vote be tabled. Um, so we did not vote on the spectator plan. Um, and then we promised news on Friday and there was more news today. So I'm briefly going to just describe what the news was um, and then describe what Mr. Nicholson, Mr. Bartle and Dr. Dietrich and I have all discussed. Um, if it were the board's um, opinion or if they were to approve that we would have spectators at athletic events. So let's start with the guidance from PDE. And it's not like me to put slides up there that are this verbose, uh, but I believe it's because of the times that we're in, I don't wanna misspeak and summarize inaccurately. So this is, uh, these are excerpts from the report on PDE's website. And it says, if you'll humor me, uh, you are likely aware that on Monday, a federal court in the Western District of Pennsylvania issued a decision striking down some of the Commonwealth's COVID related orders. The ruling is limited to the business closure order and the stay at home orders issued in March, which were later suspended, as well as the 25 person indoor and 250 person outdoor gathering limitations. School entities remain responsible for enforcing the face covering order and requiring social distancing at school and at school event, all school events, including school sporting events. The administration encourages schools to voluntarily enforce the 25 person indoor and 250 person outdoor gathering limitation while all of us wait for the court to rule on the stay request. 
We trust that school leaders understand the critical importance of maintaining the health and safety of our school communities and further trust that they will continue to maintain strong social distancing and face covering policies necessary to contain and mitigate this virus. So obviously, and while I am, I am not an attorney, um, I think we heard from Mr. Summers the other evening and you can read into this that it's really in limbo who has the authority here. And there are some districts that are not following the 250 person outdoor gathering rule. Uh, my understanding is the Western part of the state at some football games on Friday night, there were hundreds of people in the stands, if not thousands. Um, so we do not have that situation here in North Penn because currently Crawford Stadium is under construction. Uh, so any home contests would either be played on the tennis court, which honestly I've been to many tennis matches um, we don't have a large gathering for tennis matches. You might have 10 to 20 parents that are outside the fence scattered about um, a cross country race, which would be, you know, it's a 3.1 mile course. Um, again, very small crowd and they are very spread out and can do so safely. But then we have a turf field. Um, so if we were to allow spectators, the turf field adjacent to the tennis courts is where on our campus you would see spectators. Um, so now I'm going to transition into what the Suburban One League, and we are a participant and a member of Suburban One League. I'll provide, oh, I'm sorry, the guidance from PIAA. So that was PDE. This is PIAA, and then we'll bring it all the way down to our league. PIAA says um, PDE's request that schools voluntarily adhere to the 25 and 250 caps recognizing, recognizes that they, at least for the moment, are not mandatory, and adherence is up to each school. In light of the judge's ruling that 25 to 250 limits are unconstitutionally overbroad, discussion with your school board and local solicitor is appropriate. So each school considers all relevant factors in making its own decisions to how many spectators to admit for a contest. If schools decide to increase the 25 and 250 limits, they should exercise caution and good judgment in setting numbers for attendance at indoor and outdoor sports. We advise schools to apply common sense in allowing parents to see their sons and daughters play water polo and girls volleyball, where the 25 person limit cannot be complied with without separating teammates. The attendance of families at contests for support and supervision is important, and that permitting this to occur should be the priority in setting limits. Uh, we would urge schools to use common sense in developing their entry numbers and ensure the use of face masks and social distancing as referenced by the current mitigation orders. And then lastly, from the Suburban One, um, this was a press release that came out last week, and they said that the Suburban One League agreed that each school district will make its own decision regarding allowing home spectators to home games. Visiting spectators will not be permitted to attend games. The Suburban One League remains committed to the health, safety, and welfare of all of our student athletes, coaches, and spectators. The league recognizes that the challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic affect each of our member schools differently. The league will continue to proceed with the understanding that this is a fluid situation and subject to change. Um, so Mr. Summers did outline at the board meeting on Thursday night that the governor had until uh, today to veto a bill that was pushing for 25% capacity. And again, 25% capa the capacity numbers, um, in my opinion, in particular outdoor events really apply to stadiums where you could fit thousands of people. Um, so people are saying, well, we could do 25% of a 6,000 person stadium and that would be way more than 250. We do not have that problem in North Penn because we don't currently have a functioning stadium. So next slide, please, Mr. Dare. This is what we would recommend in the event that it is the board's wish that we allow some spectators at events. Um, so we're going to start, we're going to speak to the venue itself. So for right now, uh, we are suggesting that at the turf field, we limit it to 250 individuals. That includes athletes, referees, uh, workers, like people that work the score table, coaches, trainers, um, other school personnel, maybe security, um, maintenance. So all inclusive, we would say limit this to 250 individuals. When you talk about a football game, that leaves very little wiggle room, right? Because the rosters are easily 40 to 50 players, if not more. Um, then throw in the coaching staffs, throw in the trainers and some press um, and very quickly, referees, very quickly we are approaching that 250 number. Um, so it is contingent on which team is playing. 
So after the board meeting Thursday evening, I actually went out to the, the field with Mr. Nicholson on Friday morning with a tape measure. Um, and we mapped out the bleachers and measured how far apart or how many people we could fit in the stands at six feet apart at a safe social distance. We believe that there are 70, 72 current spots in the bleachers where we could place household members. And I say it that way um, specifically because, for example, if two parents were to come to a game, they could sit in, that, in a spot and they wouldn't count as two people. Rather, there are 72 spots that will allow us to keep uh, households socially distant. Um, so coaches would manage the ticket process because they are far more aware of how many household members everyone might have than say Mr. Bartle or Mr. Nicholson. So maybe Sahana is playing soccer and she says, I have three tickets. I would like uh, my three household members to come. That might be mom, dad, and brother, something like that. And the coach could uh, justify that and put Sahana down for three. So all within the confines of the sport, depending on how many athletes and other personnel are there, and then how many players there are. Um, but we believe if we were able, we could use 72 spots in the bleachers. Um, Mr. Bardo and the athletic department would then manage the tickets after the coach made that request. Uh, attendees must adhere to the following, temperatures taken, uh, screening questions, and of course, wearing a mask and maintaining six feet apart. We also want to avoid the circumstance where if you know that field well, close to Sumney Town Pike, it is uh, enclosed with a fence, a fence that folks could see through. So we do not want to have uh, gatherings and large gatherings of students, for example, at a football game outside of the fence. So they would be looking to install a windscreen around the fence. If you've seen one of those, uh, like in the outfield at the baseball stadium, you can't see through it. So there would be no point in someone standing outside of the fence because they can't see. Um, and then, of course, it will be, if this is permitted, it would be relayed to families and students that a lack of compliance ultimately would result in us not having any fans. Um, so we are hopeful that everyone is aware of how serious this is and how we must follow these rules. And my understanding from Mr. Nicholson at Suburban One meetings is that uh, people around the league have really said, like, if we don't get compliance, then we're not going to have any fans across the league. Um, Mr. Durr will be able to comment later because he did reach out to Town Men's and Township as well and our police. Um, Mr. Durr, could you, why don't I stop at the turf field before I move on to the tennis courts? And, uh, and does anybody have any questions about expectations at the turf field? Dr. Bauer, um, regarding yes, lack of compliance results, that last bullet, yes. what, how does that actually translate to what are you looking for in terms of number of um, occurrences with no mask or and then who makes the determination about making the decision that's a really good question Ms. Wesley and I don't know that we put pen to paper on that yet um, I think it would have to be a collaborative effort I know for example I asked Mr. Nicholson to be here this evening to speak to this and the field hockey game started at 6 15. it's currently 6 14. <laughs> so he's at the field hockey game with with security um, just making sure that people aren't trying to enter the field. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll have to get you an answer on what that'll look like, but I assume yeah. it would be co collaborative. Dr. Dietrich and I would be there at our first football game, for example, to see how it goes. Um, and if we think the conditions are unsafe, we would have to unfortunately come back to the board and let you know, and we would prevent fans from coming. Yeah. Well, you, you know, and again, I'm, I tend not to want to be subjective. I'd like to be objective, be quantitative. So if it's a sure. total of 250 people, possibly consider a percentage of them without masks for some period of time. Sure. Um, but for, for me, for this, I would want it before I would move forward with it, I would want to know the specifics. So it doesn't make it too subjective and questioning and, you know, people keep going back and forth. Thanks. That's, that's fair. Absolutely. We'll add it prior to tomorrow evening. I think that if once the um, recommendations are finalized, a good way to get this out to students is have um, like the high school SGA posted on their social media accounts. I know that's a great way to get information out. Like we've just gotten stuff out about homecoming. Um, so having that and also email blasts, I think are really helpful just in case you were looking for ways to get that information out in the future. Great. Thank you, Sahana. 
And uh, Dr. Bauer, I, I, I know we, we have further, further to go, but I think this is a good time to clarify as well. We went through some of the teams, how quickly we can reach a certain threshold of 250, while as you know, for tennis, it might be different or other sports. But I, I, uh, I think Sahana brings up part of that clarification that's needed. Um, maybe some of the processes, and you don't have to go into extreme detail with what um, Mr. Bartle is working on, but the goal here is to get families, especially parents of seniors, it's my understanding in the hierarchy uh, of, of you know, need for watching yes. the game, that's important. And I'm not sure we're gonna get all the way down to students, as important as it is for them to take part in this experience, but uh, could you perhaps explain some of that hierarchy from a 30,000 foot level, how, how those plans will shake out? Absolutely, Mr. Casa, thank you. So uh, that's exactly right. We're gonna have to prioritize um, because for example, let's say you have 20 seniors if you and you wanted to try to have some semblance of a senior night, maybe we, we wouldn't be able to with all the personnel involved in a football game, uh, maintain that 250 number with fidelity. So maybe of the 20 seniors, we could only invite two people from 10 of them on the first at the first game. You know, we honor 10 seniors the first game, the 10 seniors the next game, something like that. So it's really going to be determined by the number of athletes and um, the number of seniors, right? You could have a 70 person football team, but only three seniors. So maybe juniors would be able to uh, attend the events as well. But right now we are absolutely prioritizing household and family. Uh, so parents and siblings and other household members, um, but not st other students to come out and cheer um, until we, once we prioritize them and we're able to determine whether or not we have additional tickets. Um, then we would have to see what the requests come in from the student athletes. But I, I can't imagine any of our teams that'll play on that field when they are afforded the opportunity to say, you know, I have three household members, I have four household members, um, that we would be able to go beyond just family and relatives. I, I, I trust the administration's efforts on, on coming up with good plans and being nimble. And to put this in context for a safe schools committee, uh, remember, we're just reviewing this information to see, um, you know, for action tomorrow, um, based on these recommendations, you know, it, what does this committee put forward? But in the larger context, what's driving this and what Mr. Durr, I'm sure, will um, uh, add some details to, is it right, if this even goes forward and the board approves um, any version of this and spectators are there, what do we do with those who are non-compliant or what other risks do we need to understand proactively so we can uh, mitigate that risk? So I, I just wanted to make sure that the committee understood, you know, right. why are we looking at, why are we getting this detail in a safe schools committee? Well, because it, this, the, you know, we're trying to maybe deal with the lower percentage um, incident that might actually though, um, you know, be a bit more of a problem if we don't plan for it ahead of time. Sure, well, we're hopefully, uh, we are certainly hopeful that people will comply and we are going to make every effort to stream. And I just got a message from Mr. Gilmer, by the way. So we have Mrs. Fakish here this evening who is helping to stream this meeting. So this is live and out in our social media venues and I, I'm assuming YouTube. We also have girls field hockey streaming and Mr. Gilmer happens to be at Quakertown streaming volleyball. So right now, uh, using the North Penn personnel, we are streaming a board meeting, a field hockey game, and a volleyball game. Um, and that's not a huge department. So it is to be commended. It's pretty outstanding that we're making these things accessible. So that's one way that we can mitigate the, the, the risk um, by streaming things so people can stay in the comforts of their own home and be safe and watch these events. Uh, okay. Other ways of, of, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, Somebody I'm sorry, say Dr. Bell, I was gonna sure. ask, well, how many sports teams are we talking about? When does the season end? Right. And I like the idea of this streaming so everybody gets to see it from the comfort of their homes and right. they don't have to worry about breaking, breaking that outdoor number. So uh, how many sports teams are we talking about? All right, I might need to call in the closer here. Sahana might have to help me with the fall sports, but I think I can get them all. So we have field hockey, football, Cross country, boys and girls water polo, we'll count that as two. Uh, did I say soccer? So soccer and tennis and golf and girls volleyball. So eight, eight sports total. Um, so volleyball is not playing any home contests. 
and water polo that's on a, a slide coming up um, they are currently playing at whites road lansdale community pool so they're not playing on campus either so when do the seasons end i mean oh right so in general we're coming into winter so how long are we talking about for all of yeah. these teams this weekend, it felt like winter was upon us, didn't it? But um, mm -hmm. it, it is only September 21st today. It's unbelievable. So typical regular season for fall sports ends uh, towards the end of October. And then, uh, then you have postseason. So states for water polo, for example, are typically Halloween weekend or November 1st or 2nd. And then the other, it, whether uh, boys or girls go first, then the following weekend is the other state championships, which are not occurring this year. So that'll be the end of October. Football, however, can, in a typical year, last until almost December, um, because you play one game a week in the playoffs, of course. And so if the team were to go deep into the postseason, the state championships are after Thanksgiving, typically. So that's the latest any of the seasons go in the fall. Um, but winter athletics typically begin, I'm going to say roughly November 15th, right in the middle of November. So there is a conflict at times with postseason for football. That's usually the only team that's still playing. Golf, for example, is usually done middle October. Um, so they have an earlier season. So it really does depend. So could you refresh my memory? Where is football being played if we don't have the proper stadium? it's going to be played on our turf field. Um, so the, the field where we play soccer and field hockey and lacrosse, uh, we're able, it is a regulation size football field. We can host football uh, and we've done it before at times where our field was unplayable. I think for example, last year, uh, we had a Friday night game against Pensbury, perhaps that just torrential downpour. Um, we had to call the game before it even started. And then Saturday morning, the field wasn't playable. So what we ultimately ended up doing was playing the game on the turf the next morning. Um, you know, it, it certainly can't hold six or 7,000 people like Crawford Stadium, but it could hold 200 in, in, at a normal time um, in the stands, two to 300. Um, but we're not suggesting that right now. We're suggesting for a football game, you know, I'm going to give a round figure here of maybe 30 fans um, just because of the number of players and personnel required to put on a football game. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I just have a quick question. So you said that Mr. Bartle and the athletic department would manage tickets. So yep. would it just be like each individual player would request like say three number, like three tickets for their family. And then that goes to the athletic department. And then we go from there for each yes. specific team. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So if you asked for a sibling and two parents, your coach, Mr. Bartle will give your coach three tickets for you. Good question. Okay, Mr. Durr, next slide, please. And these are uh, certainly, there's less detail here. As I said before, we don't really have stands for tennis. Um, if people come uh, to cheer on the tennis teams, they just stand outside of the fence right there uh, at the edge of the parking lot, typically. Um, sometimes you'll see folks bring a lawn chair, uh, but it is not a situation where I've ever seen more than 20 parents uh, watching their child play tennis. Um, so I don't believe the 250 attendees at an outside, outside venue would be an issue. Um, they would still only be our, our home fans. And again, this includes everybody that's there, but we won't get anywhere close to 250 people for a tennis match or a cross country match. Um, and cross country is so spread out over the whole campus. And once in a while, you'll see someone standing by themselves and wonder why is that person standing there? And then a cross country runner will run by and you understand that they're cheering on. Uh, our runners. So I don't anticipate an issue and it would be very difficult to um, to put parameters in place because there isn't an, an enclosed area. There are not bleachers. Um, it's just on the campus for cross country around the entire campus. Um, but we would still require if parents choose to come, we would still require masks um, and they would be subject to have a temperature taken and be subject to screening questions. Which leads us to the final venue, I believe, Mr. Durr. And this is something uh, that we could potentially have to discuss uh, in North Penn, which would be uh, water polo. They are currently playing at uh, White's Road. 
And if you haven't noticed, as we just discussed, it has been unseasonably cold. Um, unbelievable, right? Normally we're concerned about uh, temperatures in September in the 90s um, and some of our buildings getting too warm. And this morning when I went for a run, it was 35 degrees out. So um, the water's getting awfully cold at White's Road. And um, so they are looking to play at other venues uh, if possible. There was a question of whether or not we would consider allowing them with uh, COVID-19 parameters put in place, like one entrance, screening, uh, no locker rooms, whether or not the board, and this is for a discussion for the full board, but would allow them to use our uh, Carol Natatorium for water polo, at least for practice. Um, but that'll have to be discussed again. If we were going to allow that, the full board would have to take action. Yeah, I, uh, I would recommend for the sake of time, um, and I appreciate uh, learning about this, but th that'll be good for a full board discussion on this topic. But I appreciate sure. from the safety lens. No problem. So let's go to Mr. Durr. Um, and we can jump to, and girls volleyball, we will not be hosting um, any home competitions. Um, so that's not part of this plan and whether or not we would allow spectators. Mr. Durr, uh, what did you hear from Tal Menson today? Sure, so for my part and our, our liaising with our local public safety folks, uh, I did speak with Tal Menson, Chief Dickinson earlier today, um, just to kind of get his take on, on the, the whole COVID matter. And certainly they're not in a position to provide us guidance on what we do and do not allow, but um, more specifically, what his thoughts were, should we encounter, you know, folks that um, you know, are not compliant with whatever our regulations end up being. And he did make it a point to say that his agency, his officers are not enforcing social distancing guidelines. So for example, at TYA baseball on the weekends in the township, um, they are not, uh, it's a question even if they're authorized to enforce those things. The state police of course can because it's an order of the governor, but he said his officers are staying away from enforcing social distancing masks, those sorts of things. However, as a uh, school district, we can of course make our own regulations and should we in attempt to enforce our own regulations, and run into a problem or an issue, and we exhaust our means of reasoning with somebody or de-escalating that we have internally, um, they are certainly available to assist us with, um, you know, having folks escorted from the property should that be needed. Um, so the police are always there to support our internal folks, um, but they won't, they are not enforcing those types of things unto themselves, if that makes sense. That does, thank you, Mr. Dari. And uh, before we uh, offer an opportunity for other questions, I, I, I wanna ensure that you know we've tabletopped this, so to speak, maybe if we're not all sitting in the room, but I appreciate what you've done to this point. But the last thing I wanna have happen, just as an example, and there are hundreds of permutations of what could happen, large gathering in the parking lot, people don't wanna leave, not being enforced. And then we've got a solicitor for Toa Menson and you know our legal counsel that that's what i want to avoid i want to make sure that we identify all the, these legal issues jurisdictional issues ahead of time so i appreciate this first uh you know this first look to try to clear that path but i appreciate if we we make sure even um you know from the administration that that legally we've got this figured out you know i don't think this is going to happen we have a great community everyone wants to see the kids play but we, you know, I think as the Safe Schools Committee, we have to think about the worst case scenario and plan for it. So I would just appreciate any of that you know, additional legwork. Uh, questions from anyone else? I just wanted to kind of build off on that based on what I've seen, like when I go out in public, it is hard to maintain social distancing. Um, and especially with you know, football games or fall sports, um, it's definitely been uh, an initiative of the students to try and get our lives back as much as possible. So social distancing is going to be something that's tricky to handle. But I think if the district is pretty, you know, strict about it, but obviously, you know, within reason, then we could probably make it happen. But again, it, it's definitely one of the harder things to do from what I've seen. Thank you. Other questions? Well, thank you for your support, Mr. Casa. Um, and I'm not sure if this will be something that we do take action upon tomorrow evening, um, but if we do, uh, I just appreciate the time to provide further detail. 
Yeah, this has been very helpful for us. And um, I've spoken to President Stoll uh, and, and you know, we'll look forward to whatever issues need to be deliberated upon in public uh, tomorrow. This gives us an opportunity to at least think about since it's come up through the committee. Thank you and the team, uh, Mr. Durr, uh, everyone for putting this work in because you're also trying to come up with school reopening plans and everything else that has to be dealt with. I appreciate that. Uh, we have uh, next on the agenda, and I, I appreciate, check the time here, seeing that we're a, a minute over for facilities. I, I appreciate those who've joined for the Facilities and Operations Committee. We'll probably wrap up within the next 10 minutes, to, um, depending on public comment. But this is our opportunity for other items. And that's my segue to uh, October Safe Schools and Facilities schedule. I, I would... Uh, I would like to ask the committee if we can extend it from six o'clock to seven o'clock. And I don't think we've, we've stayed to six 30 yet and planning on reopening schools in November. Um, hopefully that's going to be the case. I think we're going to have a lot more to go over uh, on the agenda. So um, I would like to at least ask the other committee members if, if that's something they would support. Yes, Mr. Costa, I would absolutely support that. And then the timing of when we have both of those meetings, is it possible that there's another committee meeting based upon the date that we determine we're going to open? That sounds reasonable to me. I think we could work with uh, Dr. Bauer on, on what fits the administration's schedule best. Yeah, to yeah. I, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, frequency and duration, I think we need to be fluid on as much as we can. I agree. I agree. And with opening schools, obviously, because it's near and dear to my heart, um, if there's anything I can do to help, I'd be more than willing to. Thank you, Sahana. Uh, and and Thank also, you. As, as we're moving forward, Sahana, feel free to reach out between these meetings because there, there might be essential insights that you have um, that, that you can still email or reach out to, to Dr. Bauer or myself to make sure that we're addressing, um, you know, from your, you're the most important stakeholder on this committee. So. Thank you. Uh, any other informational items? Uh, I have a question, Mr. Costa, and, and this is to the administration. The health and safety plan that we reviewed uh, a while ago, and I don't know how long ago, has that been revised at all? Is that something that we should, as a committee, refresh ourselves with that so we're prepared when we need to uh, start really looking at the details? I guess two questions. So we have not Has it been revised, revised and should we look at it again? <laughs> so we have not revised the health and safety plan that was adopted there in July. We chose the selection. Remember there were like these choices we had to make and then we chose the one where we said we would be fully virtual. Uh, so when we go back, uh, if it happens that we do go back, which I anticipate the board is heading that direction, for uh, some point in time, then we will simply, um, you know, invoke a different selection there. But I do think it would be helpful to bring that back out again, since it's been now probably two months or close to it uh, since we approved that just so we have it back in front of everybody again. So that, that would be fine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that would be a great idea. Is there uh, any other additional business? Uh, Mr. Durr, I, I would like to see in that agenda, which is why we'll expand it to an hour. Um, I would like a report on what we've do, been doing with training um, for safe schools, just to make sure that uh, in, you know implicit bias, training, trauma-informed, those initiatives which have put, been put in place earlier, what we're doing to build on that, uh, especially as students are returning. And uh, Dr. Bauer, I have, um, Great respect and admiration for all the hard work you're doing, which is why we didn't ask for any data discussion today, but it, it's creeping up and perhaps we should have a check in on data, um, depending on all, uh, you know, what else we decide as a board to do. Um, but I, I at least want to give fair warning uh, that we should have a discussion about some of the schools, uh, safe schools data uh, as we return. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be prepared. No problem. I know you will, but I, you know, I don't want to add, you know, I don't want to take away two more hours of sleep from you. Uh, so, uh, but that's the data, something I like to talk about, uh, Mr. Durr, you know, we, we could have a, another side conversation about 
um, just some of those updates for, for that type of training. And we did have a discussion a couple months ago. I would still like to see an update on where we're at with grievance procedures and creating a feedback loop um, when it comes down to our safe schools uh, when students come back to ensure that we're having some better quality assurance or to make sure that the student body understands that there's a process for us to be able to understand um, feedback and, and trends and patterns so that we know how to adjust and continuously improve. So I think, I think that's three items. So there, there goes that extra half hour I just booked. Sorry. Got it. All right. Uh, let's move on to uh, public comment, please. If there's a raised hand, I'll read my statement that I haven't memorized yet. At this time, just give a few seconds to catch up. I do not see any hands at this time. Just one more minute, one more second here. We're catching up on YouTube and social media. No hands, Mr. Casa. Thank, thank you, Ms. Fakish. We could not do this without you. Uh, all right, that, uh, any other issues? Um, if not, do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. All right, yeah. this meeting is adjourned.